When the Beatles finished recording Please Please Me on 26 November 1962 at Abbey Road, George Martin told them over the loudspeaker, Gentlemen, I think you've got your first number one. Love Me Do, which had also been recorded a few weeks earlier, reached number 17 during 1962. And during December of that year, the Beatles catapulted to gigantic levels of national fame. And it was not until February of the following year, 1963, that Please Please Me as a single reached number one in the new Musical Express charts, but reaching number two in the record retailer charts, which years later would evolve into the official UK chart, creating that controversial situation between whether Please Please Me had reached number one or number two. With this situation, George Martin knew that the next logical step was to record a full-length album to get it into the charts as quickly as possible. The first idea was to record a completely live album, but the cavern being subway with its concrete walls and natural echo chamber was not suitable for such an adventure. So George Martin locked himself and the Beatles in the studio to recreate the set list that the band played live. Recording a complete album in such a short space of time did not seem an unreasonable request in 1963. The songs were recorded live on a two-track BTR machine, leaving little chances for overdubs or elaborate edits. Consider also that Love Me Do, backed by P.S. I Love You, Please Please Me and its B-side, Ask Me Why, were already recorded. So the mission was to record 10 more songs to complement the 14 that were the usual in those years for a British album. The idea was to record a direct interpretation of what was their live performances and broadcasts. Their manager, Brian Epstein, left them a day of rest prior to the recording. Rhythm and Blues Part 9. Take two. Yeah. The world is treating me bad misery. The idea was for them to arrive early, but they were late. John Lennon was nursing a cold. Boxes of Lennon's throat lozenges were scattered around Studio 2. Before recording, they rehearsed a few songs. At the end of the rehearsal, George Martin asked them if they had anything else. McCartney wanted to record the old ballad, Falling in Love Again, but the number was vetoed by Martin, who considered it too cheesy. The same happened with Besame Mucho, which was about to go into Please Please Me, one of the band's favorite songs since 1960. Instead, Martin suggested A Taste of Honey, a relatively new song to the band, which he thought would fit better on the album's record. Much of the band's virtue was that they knew the songs perfectly. They had played them all over the country. That's why when they entered the studio, it was easy to record them. Minutes later, the Beatles were ready and equipped. McCartney carried his distinctive Hofner bass, Ringo Starr his premier kit, Harrison that day brought his Gretsch guitar and his Gibson acoustic, Lennon on the other hand carries his Rickenbacker and his Gibson acoustic. With everything in order, the sessions were held strictly on time. The first round was between 10am and 1pm, with a 90 minute break for lunch. Then, an afternoon schedule from 2.30 to 6pm, with a 90 minute break for dinner. And finally, an extra period between 7.30 and 11pm. With the clock running, the Beatles got to work. Years of exhausting gigs all over England and Germany had reached their key point. After the deck of failure, they were finally there, recording their first album. In that year, the band with their novice and inexperience didn't do much to experiment. For them to be recording was already way more than enough. They just wanted to do things right. They listened to what they recorded and then did two or three more takes until they got the one they were satisfied with. 10 songs recorded in one day, a complete odyssey for what would later become the most perfectionist band in the world. This chapter will focus on everything that was done that day. The Beatles clearly had high hopes for this relatively new composition, giving it a place of an hour as the first song recorded that day. It had been written several months earlier in the living room of the McCartney family home. A copy of West Side Story soundtrack played as direct role in influencing the track. In our case, the place was in the mind, recalled McCartney in his authorized biography. This was a big difference to what we were writing in those years. We were getting a bit more cerebral. Given that it was the first song intentionally recorded for his recording debut on an album, its maturity was a harbinger of good things to come. For Lennon, the song held promise as a potential highlight. The initial take was a complete run-through, almost identical to the final version. The only thing that changed in the different takes was Lennon's harmonica for an intro on Harrison's guitar. Most of them are confused with the first versions. Between the takes of that day, you can hear Lennon also playing with harmonica in an intro similar to the one in Please Please Me. The vocals also proved to be a sticking point, with Lennon's voice showing the effects of his sore throat even this early in the day. Just before the fifth take, McCartney can be heard giving Lennon advice on how to lengthen a line in the song. It works better if you do it on the beat somehow. Think of the beat in your head, says McCartney in the takes. They almost had it on take nine, but McCartney's voice began to falter on the high harmonies. Clearly frustrated, the bass player can be heard muttering sarcastically. 
Take 15. Before the actual take, take 10, he tried to provide the backing track, but as noon approached, the band decided to move on to another promising track. Since the days of the cavern, this song was known as 17. Even Norman Smith, the sound engineer, named it that way in the first take. George Martin completely disapproved of the song's title. From the control room, he said, I think it should have a different title. Lyrically, the song paid homage to Young Blood by the Coaster song, also to Louis Armstrong and Little Queenie by Chuck Berry. Years later, McCartney said that the bass line from Berry's 1961 song, I'm Talking About You, was an essential part of his repertoire. So on, I saw her standing there, Paul McCartney played the same bass line, and it matched the Beatles' number perfectly. The Beatles recorded the final version on the first take, retaining the register of their famous falsetto that would become their trademark in their live performances when they shook their heads. However, George Martin would push for a second take to avoid risks. Take number two would be less successful as Lennon and McCartney had difficulty remembering the song and getting on the same page. Lennon said it was terrible. George Martin tried to salvage the situation by having the band record the pieces of the failed lines on take three, plus rehearsals of Harrison's solo on take four and five. The tension began to show when take six broke in the middle. Too fast, said McCartney. But there's no wrong word, said George Martin from the control room. Yes, but I mean it's too fast anyway, replied McCartney. On take seven, McCartney was again stopping the recording too fast again. Before showing his apology for being a perfectionist, all this was while demonstrating to his mates the right tempo for the song. Since those years, Ringo Starr was the one who made the least mistakes, but on take 8, the mistake was his. A false beat stopped the take completely. While they were rethinking everything to get to take number 9, McCartney started with this. One, two, three, four! The effect was so energizing that George Martin then cut it into the front of take 1 creating one of the most exemplary and iconic debuts in music history. Not since Elvis Presley's debut had anything like it happened. The introduction of Take 9 with the Take 1 track made this the opening track of the album. Take 23! So what are you gonna do? Usually after the morning sessions in the studio, the next 90 minutes were reserved for the artists and staff to have lunch. The Beatles were somewhat distressed by their slow progress. While George Martin and Norman Smith went to get something to eat, the Beatles stayed in the studio, drinking milk. When they returned, the Beatles were rehearsing again. They couldn't believe it. Norman Smith was amazed because they had never seen a band working as a group during their lunch break before. A taste of honey. For their first recording of the afternoon, they went with A Taste of Honey a pop standard that Lenny Welch had covered the previous year. Both Epstein and Martin saw the value of including a sophisticated adult contemporary ballad. This to add empathy and versatility to the band. McCartney was also interested in including it because of his love of pre-war tunes. Five takes of the song were recorded, two of which were incomplete, the band playing and singing live. The fifth take was temporarily selected as the final take. Listen. This track was my song on the album. George Harrison complained in Anthology. I didn't like my voice in it. I didn't even know how to sing. Nobody told me how to do it. Harrison would close. Lennon wrote most of the song based on a childhood memory of his mother. The song has its influences from the theme song, I'm Wishing, from the 1937 Disney movie Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Wanna know a secret? Promise not to tell? Lennon included a slow intro, perhaps as a nod to his vintage inspiration. Or perhaps he took his cue from the likes of Carole King and Jerry Goffin, who had recently employed a similar technique on several of their hits. Discounting two false starts, the Beatles performed four complete takes of the song, with take number six recording as the best. George Martin made a point of over-recording the backing harmonies twice more. They always over-recorded some of Ringo's parts during the bridge. Take eight was the finished version. The overdubs of the previous song apparently triggered something in Martin and the boys, because the next hour and a quarter was spent polishing songs that were already recorded. George, Ringo, and John went to take a break while McCartney overdubbed the double vocals on A Taste of Honey, which resulted in a much richer and fuller sound during some verses. Here for the first time, the echo chamber was used, a technique that would be used over and over again throughout his career. 
Fearing that Harrison's guitar would lack impact, Martin suggested that Lennon perform the intro riff of There's a Place on harmonica. The trick had already been used on two previous singles. Lennon returned from the break and recorded the song for take three, effectively burying Harrison's work, and Lennon would begin to establish himself as an expert in harmonica introductions. He had done it on Love Me Do, he had done it on Please Please Me, he had done it on this track, and would later do it again on From Me To You and a few other tracks. In an effort to replicate the excitement of a crowd stomping and pounding, Martin requested that the Beatles add clapping to what would become the album opener. The band gathered around a microphone as tape operations indicated take one, but the first attempt to over-record clapping was affected by volume problems, but was later modified and completed the song on take 12. Lennon and McCartney wrote Misery to cement their reputation as songwriters for hire. This song was written for Helen Shapiro, a young singer who was the headliner on the Beatles tour for those years. Helen's manager felt the track was quite severe and not suitable for a teenage singer. They rejected it. McCartney recalled, It may not have been that successful for her because it was quite a depressing song. It was quite pessimistic. Eventually, the track went to another of their tour mates, Kenny Lynch, which made him the first artist to cover a Lennon and McCartney song on record. The Beatles version required 11 takes to complete. The first take in many ways was their best. Unfortunately, Harrison's guitar was a little too out of time on the bridge, requiring other opportunities. Take two was also good, but Martin stopped the song after realizing that Harrison's guitar was distorted. A few more false starts and some minor mistakes followed. Take six was perhaps the most interesting of all, with some flashy fills on the drums and some Harrison touches that didn't make it into the final cut. In the end, George Martin requested a more streamlined approach on take number seven. The guitar line for George Harrison was becoming too difficult to perfect, so it was decided to add a piano part. Nine days later on February 20th, without the band's participation, Take 9 would be the last attempt that day before the clock struck dinner time. George Martin put together the beginning of Take 7 and the end of Take 9 to create the recorded version. The edit can be heard on the first word of the third verse. The afternoon session having concluded, the Hungry Beatles took a quick lunch in the EMI canteen. Two-thirds of the recording had gone, and they had produced only half of the required songs. They had to play five songs in two and a half hours to complete the record. But, in the face of the anguish, they had the positivity that the remaining songs, mostly covers, were pillars in their repertoire. They could play these songs perfectly, as they had practically been in their heads since the Hamburg years. With their eyes on the clock, they returned to Studio 2, determined to do the five songs. Unfortunately, the start of their afternoon session turned out to be a colossal waste of time, as the Beatles went over 13 times an original song that would not end up on the album. Hold Me Tight. It was part of their tours, but they never considered it as one of their best songs. Even its composer dismissed it as saying it was a failed attempt at a single that later became an acceptable filler. Lennon was also blunt when evaluating it years later in 1980, saying it was a rather poor song that had never interested him at all. Perhaps for that reason, Hold Me Tight never took off during the Please Please Me session. The tapes of the song that day were destroyed. Despite being abandoned that day, the song would be re-recorded on the band's next album, with the Beatles. The frustrating experience of Hold Me Tight was now behind them. They followed with Anna, Go To Him, a song that paid homage to one of their great heroes. Arthur Alexander's song would be an emblem of the Beatles. By take number three, the song was completed. It seemed that the Beatles were going up in excitement, productivity, and quality. Fifteen minutes to record this song. After Lennon, it was Ringo's turn. A song that Ringo played since his pre-Beatles days with Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. As he did on stage, Ringo sang and played at the same time. Something that any drummer can confirm is not an easy task. The song came out without any problem. Fifteen minutes were enough to move to the next song. Originally recorded by The Cookies, a New York rock and blues group, Chains described the Beatles' formidable ability to adapt deep-cut American pop songs. Since the Beatles were represented by Brian Epstein, having special access to his record store, Harrison bought the single Chains in 1962 and claimed the lead vocal as his own for recording on the album. The band recorded two complete versions of the song, considering the first take as the best for the record. The next number recorded by the band was another cover. For this song, three takes were enough. 
one of which was a false start that had an ending that was labeled as the best. The bass recording stayed and would be completed nine days later. On February 20th, George Martin insisted that Harrison improve his guitar solo. When they got to this song, Lennon's voice was already damaged. The good thing is that there was only one song left to do. Another essential track recorded in 15 minutes. George Martin managed to get the Beatles to work a few extra hours, as they were going on tour the next day, and it was necessary to finish the songs that day. Around 10 o'clock at night, they went to the canteen for coffee and cookies, and to consider what they would play for their last song. In a conversation recalled by Norman Smith, he remembers George Martin saying to the Beatles, I think I heard them say they would play La Bamba. McCartney was a little confused and then said, You mean Twist and Shout? To which Martin replied, Yes, Twist and Shout. The idea was instantly accepted. George Martin had already heard this song on one of his visits to the cavern. No one imagined that the impact of this song would become the most famous cover that the Beatles would ever make in their career. The song had to come out in one take. John Lennon practically had no voice anymore. So, he tore his larynx during the recording. The recording was iconic. Even though everyone was tired, it turned out to be spectacular. At the end, everyone was practically amazed with the Beatles' performance. Lennon took a couple more pills and gargled with milk, and that was it. The song almost killed me, John Lennon would say years later. My voice wasn't the same for a while. It was like sandpaper. Still, I was ashamed knowing I could have sung it better, said John Lennon in 1970. Still finished, he briefly tried a second take, but there was no sense. Lennon had given it his all on the first. It was good enough for the record, and nothing more was needed. Twist and Shout was released with no modifications, no overdubs, and no second chances. At the end of the session, George Martin looked down from the control room and said in amazement, I don't know how they do it. We've been recording all day, and the more they go, the better they do it. With 14 songs recorded, there was nothing left to do but stand back and admire the work. At half past 10, the Beatles climbed the stairs from the studio floor to the control room for a chance to hear their debut album for the first time. Listening to that record was one of our most disturbing experiences, said Lennon in 1963. If it hadn't gone well somehow, we would have wanted to do it again, but we were very happy with the result. McCartney also agreed, saying it was one of their main ambitions in their lives. We were delighted and sore-throated, but if we hadn't done it, sore or not sore-throated, we would have tried it again. Please Please Me Today is a jewel of the music world, recorded practically in one day, a sample of its power and quality that was just beginning and would be developed over the years. Thanks for watching this video. Expect more videos in this series. Don't forget to hit subscribe. This is Music Box. Take 10. Follow me, take 11.